Yeah. Maybe um, I kind of want to know because um, this is not the first time I saw this, but um, the first time I saw this, I was somewhat um, distracted, I guess. Yeah. And um, how many people kind of caught on very quickly to what was going on with uh, with the mirrors? Immediately, like you were like, oh yeah, I see what that. Is. Um, because for me, it was kind of. Um, a surprising moment, I guess, or a shocking moment, because I was just paying attention to the the soundtrack, as it were. Because it, at first, I kind of understood this to be a documentary, and was just listening to the people talking, like this kind of like you know moving of talking heads. And actually, what I was paying attention to was nothing to do with what the the film was about. Really, I was kind of paying attention to more what the people, how the people looked, and how they were dressed. Yeah. Uh, which is itself like really interesting for me because I was kind of thinking about like all of these French people and the way that they were dressed and anyway. Um, that's another topic. But then like the moment when all of a sudden I was like, there's this line in the landscape and what is that line about on the bridge? You know, that was the first time I saw it. I was like, something's a little odd. And then, you know, you start catching and the kind of the way that it builds is um I thought that was really Important, I guess, to the, the structure of the film, right? Or yeah, no, actually, I was also thinking when I watched it again just now that I was like, is it even necessary to have this reveal? Mm -hmm. Because maybe also because of the size of the projection, I found it was actually more obvious uh, on the scale to mm -hmm. see the the mirrors, whereas I watched it before on my laptop, so it was quite a small image and. I mean, I figured that that's what was happening because I just knew that, that this is like a therapy that people with the phantom limb syndrome do in order to like regain control of their non-existent limb in order to you know either feel the pain or like to in in a way to visualize terms, yeah. yeah they have to visualize it. That's the therapy. So I knew that that was so. I was actually a little bit biased, but here I thought it was a little bit more obvious. And then I thought, what? Well, but maybe it's like a too dramatic a gesture to have this big reveal mm -hmm. at the end. Or is it actually the moment in the film where everyone becomes human? Maybe it's actually very humanizing. I don't know. I'm a bit on the fence about it. I mean, I guess, it, I guess it's part of that. Um, it's trying to give the viewer a sense of relationship to what that process would be like, I guess, for somebody who's looking at their phantom limb in the mirror and, and that reveal process and sort of the... Uh, I don't know, the, not necessarily the shock of it, but like the um, the reality that it is such a sort of farce in some ways mm. to have it reflected back. I was also just struck by the number of topics that Kader Atiyah manages to raise in 45 minutes. So I started making a list. I mean, it starts out with uh, this whole thing about historical memory and trauma, and you're like, okay, you know, and the, obviously the, the phantom limb itself, like the, the surgery aspect, the medical aspect of it, um, and then we go into dub music. And then it's like back to very specific historical traumas with you know, Turkey and Armenia, and then colonialism and the European context. And then we get into the psychoanalytic relationship, the doubling, the other. Um, there's all this stuff about um, like the architecture even of the film. I mean, because it's, I think it's pretty obviously shot in Berlin. So uh, there's all of this old Soviet space that they're using and these so there's soviet space in the film mm -hmm. so there's the east west uh, berlin dynamic there's also railway tracks which have to do with uh, the holocaust and world war ii and that germany's relationship to that which is separate from the cold war experience of germany mm -hmm. there's this whole idea of individual suffering versus collective suffering and whether or not you know loss of individuals um, is something that's borne by the entire community and how uh, yeah, particular acts of violence impact whole groups of people through time. Um, and then it goes back into ideas of um, kind of reconciliation for society, treatment for trauma. Uh, there's the, the African American angle that comes in later in the film, both through the um, historian and the uh, actor. Um, so it's just, and oh, and then there's Islam and Christianity, um, and 
Cato's thesis that um, which he elaborates on elsewhere that like, the fact that European civilizations showed up in the Muslim world um, in the 18th century and wrecked them um, led to all of this. Uh, like this is alluded to when he's talking when that scholar is talking about the idea of the caliphate <laughs> being disrupted and that there's this return of a longing uh, that was long displaced for uh, uh, a caliphate in the sense of like a Muslim community, a global community, and that was destroyed by uh, English and, and European colonialism. So it just touches on all of these topics in 45 minutes, and also Kader Atiyah is not present at all in the film. I mean, you can maybe hear his voice asking questions, but generally, as an artist, he's completely absent. Uh, but he manages also to have a very strong kind of thesis and um, a presence that you know comes through the film just by having other people uh, respond to questions. So I was really struck by these uh, polarities uh, that he manages to raise so much and also be so absent at the same time. Um, well, yeah, I think that for me, what was so why I so appreciated having the opportunity to watch this and now having the chance to talk about it is because I feel like, you know, um, I've known about his work for a while now, and um, for me, there was a moment maybe about six or seven years ago when, you know, he started making work that was very much related to these questions of amputation and disfigurement. Um, and uh, I first saw a large-scale installation in, at Documenta that was in 2012, you know, where there was juxtapositions of World War I amputees and to figure uh, people, uh, veterans who had been disfigured, and with um, uh, sculptures and other kinds of objects that kind of showed, that was kind of, you know, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. And there it was um, maybe more kind of, it felt, and some, sometimes it felt tendentious in the way that it was the kind of the positioning of this. Whereas what was interesting about um, this film is that in this way that almost kind of creeps up on you because it's about, it starts off being about a fairly um, medical issue, right? You know, people who lose their limbs and then how do they? And slowly through accretion, one by one bit at a time, you kind of start seeing the way that things kind of come into focus and the way between, you know, as one person says, I think the surgeon is the first one to say it between the social body and the individual body, and that there's a way in which this, you know, we imagine ourselves to be part of a larger body, and that trauma can happen to that kind of body just the same way that we ourselves have this imagination of our entirety, of our the entirety of our body, that is not just simply kind of you know visual, but also is mental. It's also you know um, sensorial, right? And so if something happens to that body, we don't simply just lose it. We still imagine as if it's there. And the way that there's that kind of the double way that the imagination can function on a very kind of individual level, but also on a social level, I thought it kind of really kind of. Um, I don't know, it just really kind of came into focus for me with this film in a way that, you know, maybe it was always present and it was always kind of there, but it didn't quite um, do the same way. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that, I mean, I think it's, it's part of this body of work that he's been working on for several years, dealing with this idea of repair. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that perhaps because it is a film, you start to see some of the thinking behind these, sort of unpacking the thinking behind these different ideas surrounding repair that appeared in that earlier work, or, or you know, recent works. And I think, you know, one thing, I guess, for Kader in his practice, it, it, the difference between sort of um, traditional or pr primitive societies and their valuing, um, it, almost imperfect, um, Things or things not needing to be repaired in the same ways that that for him Western societies have this like compulsion to do. Um, I think you just see him working through some of these larger ideas around like um, 
yeah, from, from the body through to this much more collected sense of identity and those issues. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm thinking now also that about whether or not um, this idea of wholeness, I mean, the whole film is premised upon uh, instances where parts have been removed, and it does, by implication, uh, I think, suggest that there's a kind of ideal state of wholeness, that a, a body would be whole or a social community would be whole. Um, and I find that that would be something that I would want to ask Kada, like, you know, is there a, such a thing as a whole community or like a whole body? And, you know, there's no, I mean, everything is asymmetrical, even in a body or like even in a community, there's not. So, sure, um, a, f a phantom limb is a very violent instance of something being removed from the whole and of a very brutal loss, but um, even with a, without an amputation or without a kind of historical trauma like a, a genocide, um, was there ever this wholeness that you could point back to? I, I actually don't know if he's positing that there is a kind of a wholeness. Um, I think the film itself, the way that it kind of, we enter in mid uh, interview or mid conversation where this person, you know, one of the first doctors is just, you know, he literally, we know that he's already been talking and somehow we don't quite catch what he begins to say, you know, or what he's been saying, but, you know, we just have to kind of be, we're inserted, plunged midstream. And at the end, that ending is very tricky because at the same time, it's kind of like this very, um, like, oh, this is where my life begins. And it's like this very violent cut, right, where it just like stops abruptly. Um, and there's a way in which the editing of the film, it, the formal qualities of the film, I thought were very important to constructing or kind of suggesting the, the it's not really one narrative, right? It's like multiple strands of, an, of different narratives that kind of come in and out. And I think the film structurally refuses a wholeness. Like it doesn't like present this kind of classic arc of like beginning, middle and end or like argument thesis antithesis you know synthesis or something like that it really kind of just like is there's multiple pieces there's multiple parts and they don't clearly click in any one way or in a kind of logical way but they're there i mean i think it's more like there is an imaginary uh, i guess about a gestalt right but it, that we have but i don't know if it's saying that you know that is um real yeah, I mean, I doubt that Kader would, would yeah. you know, think that there is such a thing as a perfect whole, but I just would want to hear him kind of articulate yeah. what that pre-amputation condition is. Mm. Uh, you know, just as, I mean, maybe, maybe in his mind it would be a series of amputations or that like it's a, you know, one trauma leads to another. I, I, maybe that's also where I don't totally know where he falls on. Uh, through the voices that he represents. Is, um, because when the African-American historian starts talking about his critiques of trauma as an idea, uh, it begins to move away from, say, the Lithuanian post-Soviet uh, context, uh, or like even the German idea of trauma. I mean, in my conception of having spent time in, in Berlin is like there's a very particular idea uh, and that's quite institutionalized in Berlin, especially about historical trauma and how to deal with it and reconcile it. I mean, Berlin, just as a city, has a, amazing spaces that are unique in the world in terms of commemorating events that happened there and elsewhere in Germany. And that is something that German society made uh, a very conscious choice to do, and a lot of other societies around the world haven't done that and are not going to do it. Yeah. So, but so that idea of trauma in the German sense in relation to the Holocaust, in my mind, seemed like, or there was a, maybe a moment in the film where we were going to hear a kind of critique of that form of trauma, um, where there, and that idea of trauma is predicated really on an original event that is then replicated. So I guess I would want to hear Cotter kind of maybe nuance that in a different way. 
But he's not here. I know, I know. But he's a great, yeah. He's the phantom. Exactly. <laughs> the phantom of the evening. But I think one thing the film kind of um, really brings up for me, at least, is like really emphasizing how complicated this idea of loss is. Um, and like the fact that like these. Um, Patients with a phantom limb have to be exposed repeatedly to the image of the limb to alleviate the pain, and and, and it's basically it's a it's a cognitive kind of short circuit that your body somehow has not caught up with the fact that part of it is missing. Um, th so I think this this quite s simple analogy is actually very complex and like gives you um, a good sense of his feelings about how complicated. This notion of loss or disappearance is. Yeah. I think it's also interesting the way that he selects who speaks and who doesn't speak, right? Because um, we have this kind of cascade of people who are surgeons, who are professors, who are this and or that, but only one of the, um, the actors or models actually speaks, and he doesn't so much speak about um, the his phantom limb situation or syndrome, right? It's really, and what he talks about in place of that is talking about the, the loss of his Algerian, Algerian um, identity or his ethnicity and kind of, or his culture and trying to kind of, um, how, what, what he does to try to reconnect with that, right? And I think that there's, that's one of the ways in which the two levels of the, the kind of the very medical condition and the social condition kind of Reconnect, or there's, or kind of creates this kind of linkage between those. Um, it's interesting that you know everyone else basically is there, kind of at first seen whole, and then finally not seen whole. I guess. Yeah, the other figure I thought was interesting was actually the French surgeon, um, because he. Which French surgeon? Oh, sorry, the, the guy in the blue suit who is talking about gestures. Yeah. Um, because. He is presented, um, I mean, very, obviously very neutrally, but he's talking about his practice. And he's talking about it in terms of memories of gestures and learning certain gestures. But this time I'm watching it, I was really aware of how the gestures that he was making with his like, hands. What kind of surgery gestures are those? Well, yeah, they're, like, 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 they're incisions. But he's like okay. cutting bodies. No, no, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, everybody else, or not everybody else, um, most of the other people in the film are talking about um, situations in which, the, you know, they or their communities have been in some way excised or cut, you know, and then you have this one person who is so proud of his abilities to make these gestures, mm -hmm. and he's kind of either instinctively or accidentally just replicating, you know, his finest gestures, you know, but he's the one in that scene who is, you know, essentially doing the cutting. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he seems somewhat unaware, maybe, that he's going to end up in this um, context. But I, I, I didn't feel like he's so proud of himself that there's something, um, I don't know, not offensive. He's not demonized in the film, mm -hmm. I don't think. I mean, because it, he introduces this idea of gestures as memory, or that, like, you know, things that you learn are passed down. I yeah, I guess, I mean, on that note, I was, I was also very surprised by how, like, emotionally intelligent all of the, most of the surgeons were, like, thinking about this loss of something that, even though it's part of their job as a surgeon to complete this act, it's, um, the, all of them, well, almost all of them, had it, like a, a profound sense of the impact that that would have on the person that was losing this limb, and that this would be like a, a as much a psychological as a physical, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, intervention, I guess. I thought the implication was there fairly strongly that itself, like culture, but specifically art, is a process of healing and remediation. And that the visual device of using a mirror to, uh, or even, a, like you could even think of the mirrors with the armature on them um, as a bit like a sculpture. 
Um, I mean, we don't have the image, but you know, even in the Lima Falcon show, that you have the television uh, armature uh, paired next to the um, sculpture in one of those works. So you do have this idea that some, something, yeah. So you do start to, see, I started to see the mirrors as a whole object. And, um, anyway, and elsewhere, I felt like the implication again was that, that art in, it, in the way that it talks about trauma, I mean, not just visual art, but all culture, mm -hmm. is itself this mirrored process where we can look at ourselves and um, as a society be whole again. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was very obvious or do you worry about myself oversimplifying? Um, I wouldn't say that it's obvious because that's not the that's not what I'm trying to so maybe not. Or maybe I just kind of over went over my head. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, did you find that like Yeah, I guess I, I mean I, I guess I saw that more of like a a way of presenting this idea of loss. Um, Because Connor's other work, going back to the scars, and I, I didn't see the Shanghai Biennale, but I know that you know he had one of his pieces where he repairs a big crack in concrete with these with metal joinery, basically. And he has this idea that he writes about, saying saying that scars are the way that we remember. Mm -hmm. So that there's this importance, because otherwise, the, this is also suggested a little bit in the film, but um, he. Is essentially saying, I mean, one of the historians is talking about how um, it's important, obviously, to remember, but that um, Ben Cotter's uh, uh, implication is that the healed body is the way that we actually remember that the real things happened. And he writes about this in some of his essays. So, um, yeah, knowing that Cotter makes objects that are scars or that are canvases that have been stitched together. Um, for me, it makes it very ex explicit that you know he thinks that art is some sort of process of social remediation, not repair. I mean, he apparently thinks that repair is uh, impossible. Yeah, I mean, actually, now that you put it that way, I would say that that isn't at all what um, I understand this film and in some ways what the work is. Like, I, I don't think of his work really as repair. I mean, in some ways, yeah, it's kind of like, oh, it's about, but it's not really, I mean, it's not literally about running because it's, you know, like the crack is already there and what he does, like the building's not going to fall apart if you remove the, you know, like, it's more like it's, Drawing attention to the, you know, what the French call the fight or the or the 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 seam, the fault, right? And what this film does, I think, in some ways, is kind of um, start from. I think maybe that's one way of thinking about what this film does for me is a kind of is getting us to this place where we start off thinking everything's okay and everything is normal, and then starting to notice. Um, little by little, or maybe all at once for some of the people in the audience, like that there are these cracks in this kind of seamless imagery and, you know, the, the way that, because there's something very, very um, carefully constructed about all of these mirrors and you see towards the end, you know, like the vices that are used to hold the mirror just in place so that you have the perfect you know, um, double image of the man with the with the cup with the bread, right? So it looks like he's exactly like you know whole, or the way that the DJ like you know there's this like very tricky like m sequence where he's like a, he's mixing and then his hands seem to come together and then they come apart, but you never quite see the hand both hands when they're apart, which would kind of give it away only when they're very, very close. And it's like, oh, well, you just kind of do. You know, so there's this very careful and calibrated way in which it's slowly revealed. And I think like the most, um, it's like the, the maybe the one the moment that's most obvious is like when the person's standing in front of the large monument, right? Um, and then all of a sudden you have this man who's hobbling and he walks across and he gets cut by the mirror. And then someone else gets cut by coming the other way, gets cut by the mirror. And if you don't notice it by then, you're really kind of not watching, right? But um, but it's kind of like 
it's really kind of about reaching this point where you can see it, and then it kind of, it basically shows you everything, right? It's like okay, this is um, what you weren't seeing in some ways. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I, that's just where the next level. I mean, because of the, this reveal, I leapt to this next metaphorical level about you know it, art itself being the thing that is going to make these people whole, or like you know he's floating it out there. I mean, it doesn't have anybody saying this, but uh, except for one person who says the culture and affection. I don't know how to quite understand that in the French way, but. Um, it is, uh, those are the two things that can heal trauma. Yeah. Do you know what he meant by affection in that context? Like, I think affection is literally... Just like love? Yeah. Okay. Not affectation. Not affectation. <laughs> okay. Should we take questions or comments from people who are still here? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to keep talking, but maybe other people have reactions. Thank you for um, the great conversation about this work. Um, I just have a little comment, and then I also have a question. Right. Um, um, I, I, I thought that, you know, you talked about the reveal a little bit and whether it was necessary. Um, and I thought it was interesting because, you know, in addition to um, the psychoanalytic theory, the trauma studies that were, you know, in, in the medical kind of terminologies, you know, there, there's also this play on kind of uh, uh, magic, you know, it's, it's like, you know, um, you know, because throughout the whole film, you know, I, I knew he was using mirrors, um, you know, contrary to, you know, some of you. Um, I, so, 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 so the, the whole point, so, so, so the whole point, I was trying to, like, poke at, like, the, the scenes, right, you know, where, where does the mirror image start and where, where does, you know, reality starts. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting that, like, you know, um, you know, the artist here, right, it's like, you know, it's not just the film editor, he's not just the, you know, the camera lens, you know, he's also um, the magician, you know, he's also the trickster, you know, he's someone who tricks you into um, in, in, in forming a mental and visual representation of what it feels like to be whole, right, to have a complete image. Um, so so I, I, I thought that lens and that angle is very important and, and that's why ultimately I've decided that you know I the, the reveal is important and I think he has executed it very elegantly you know slowly slowly and then you know when it got to the DJ I was like what you know I, I actually did not know that you know um, he was playing you know he he lost a, a limb um, so my question is right um, kind of Speaking of local traumas, right? Um, you know, since you know this, you know, we're screening this in Hong Kong and Tycoon. How how would you propose, um, you know, us in Hong Kong um, utilize some of the lessons or skills from you know the phantom limp mirror exercises in treating our own traumas? Um, you know, the, the trauma of, you know, being colonized, the trauma of, you know, under uh, somehow, you know, authoritarian government, you know, not having autonomy or, um, you know, self-determination. Um, how should Hong Kong people use the lessons of, you know, this kind of phantom limb to, um, to treat, you know, to, to give ourselves, you know, our own therapy? Do you have an answer? Or, um, I, I don't have an answer to the question per se, but um, I have a comment maybe to make that kind of is connected to that, which is that you know, the, so the, the, the installation that I was talking about from 2012 at Documenta, a lot of the pictures, uh, the photographs that were in that, yeah, so 
Um, maybe if we can go back one. A lot of these photographs, um, I, I had seen them before. I knew about them because of um, scholarship on World War I. And what uh, some of them are of that, and some of them are of other things. Um, but um, in the case of World War I, what had happened was that there was this cataclysmic war that had occurred, and all of a sudden you had veterans who had been severely disfigured during the war reintegrating into society. And they were the embodied representation or the kind of reminders of what had happened and you know that people just couldn't avoid it was constant, there were constant reminders on the street in the you know every in everyday life that this thing had this event had taken place and um, it's one thing to kind of know about a war and say okay World War one happened 1914 1918 it's another thing to be in a society where you're constantly seeing people who bear those traces on their bodies. Um, and I think that that was something that um, was really kind of interesting to think about, you know, um, because I learned about these, uh, I first saw these images in comparison or in, in discussions about Dada, for instance, and Dada and the way that Dada shows these unwhole image uh, bodies, right? And where does that, what is that, what is the context for understanding that? And part of that has to do with the, these cuts and these ruptures. Um, and the way that those ruptures found themselves on human bodies, on um, people. And um, the, I'm talking about this because one of the things that um, actually um, struck me when I moved to Hong Kong was the number of people who uh, were handicapped or crippled um, that I would encounter in everyday life just walking in the street. and. Um, that was a reminder, to me anyway, of what Hong Kong society, what its history had been, and what exactly life like was here, um, as opposed to the United States or, the United, or California, which is where I was coming from. And that there was a very different kind of trajectory of the citizens here versus the citizens there, and what resources were available what medical resources, what social resources were available to people. And that has a very clear impression, that leaves a very clear impression on the way people appear. And um, this is actually something that, you know, I was really just kind of, you know, when I was not noticing, while well, I was not noticing the mirror, I was looking at the people themselves in the film. And that was something that really struck me as well, which is that, you know, like the, so the, the professor who's talking about um, Christian, the, the uh, psychology professor, you know, like he's a very homely person. He's a very, very homely professor. And then there's the Lithuanian historian, or I'm not sure if she's an archivist or whatever, but she's also very homely in her appearance. And there's something about both of them that are very specifically, like they're embodied reminders that society in Europe in the post-World War II was a specific way, and society was a specific way. And I think that that's something that now I feel like is being totally washed away in this kind of image culture that we're in, where you know the talking heads are all basically like Botoxed and everyone is kind of perfect. And one of the things that's really interesting about this film is the selection of the the people who are talking and how they appear. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, Nick, I can't really talk about Hong Kong um, specifically, but um, I would say that so the films that Qatar made for the Guangzhou Biennale are more explicitly engaged with shamanism and different kinds of spiritual traditions in uh, Korea and Vietnam, and how he tries to frame both um, historical traumas like the Guangzhou uprising and also the Vietnam or the American War in Vietnam um, in terms of, so he interviews people who were both kind of involved in it from uh, as victims like people who participated or whose partners participated in the Guangzhou uprising who were killed or tortured and then he also interviews people who are shamans or who work in um, yeah, maybe Qatar wouldn't like the word magical, but who work in like spiritual traditions that really try to make the, if not the physical body whole again, then a kind of 
uh, psyche or uh, collective psyche whole again through you know spiritual practices. Um, so that's something, and those works maybe would relate more, or I can see them relating a little bit more to specific uh, context, uh, the specific context of Hong Kong, um, because I you know, I do find it very. Yeah, I mean, for lack of a better word, interesting, though, like, and I don't really understand it very well, but, you know, Hong Kong's relationship to certain um, shamanistic, spiritualistic, you know, uh, practices that do seem to be related, maybe, to certain kinds of historical traumas. But, yeah, I'm really not the person to talk to about that. this evening. I hope you enjoyed the film um, and the panel. So, thank you. Thank you.